All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to Marquette University Law School. I see a few familiar faces from yesterday. We had a packed uh, house yesterday for Senator Feingold. Uh, it's good to have you back here with us today. This is On the Issues, our continuing series of conversations with news and policy makers, people who, as we say, are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. And today we're going to be talking about the group Common Ground, and we are joined today by the lead organizer for Common Ground, Keisha Crum, and also by Jennifer O'Hare, who is a, a strategy team member for Common Ground. So please give them both a warm welcome to Marquette University Law School. So some of you in this room are familiar with Common Ground, and, uh, and some of you are probably more familiar with them because of the events of the last year and the discussions about a new arena in downtown Milwaukee. And we will definitely spend some time talking to both uh, Keisha and Jennifer about that today. But I want this to be an opportunity for people to get a better understanding of who Common Ground is, what it's doing, and the difference it hopes to make in this community. So Keisha, I'm going to begin with you by, by asking a very simple question. Tell us about the who part of this. Who is Common Ground? Yeah. Common Ground is a four-county organization of about 50 member organizations and 40, that have about 40,000 people that live and work in the Wallam counties, I call them. Um, so Milwaukee and Waukesha and, yeah, okay. Ozaki yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, Washington. Washington. And Washington, mm -hmm. yes. And those organizations for the last eight years are the ones that have driven all of our work from the beginning before we were common ground to the present day. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the goals of Common Ground, Jennifer. What, what do you hope to do? Well, the basic goal of Common Ground is that people can come together in a group that's large enough and strategic enough to get things done in the community and to make the places we live better places to live. Give me an example, uh, Keisha, of the kind of uh, uh, difference you hope to make. You want to make communities better uh, to live in, uh, better to raise kids in. Um, but, but give me a sense of, of why this organization is important when, in fact, there are other community groups out there uh, doing good work. What makes Common Ground different in that sense? Yeah, um, I think there's three things that makes us different. One is that we're about people. And so the sense that people find this organization because they're interested in making themselves better and making their communities better. The second is that we're about power not about programs or process. Lots of organizations spend a lot of time on a process and putting together wonderful reports, um, but are not really engaging people in making decisions around the places they care about and the people they love. And the other thing is that we're about productivity. We like to get things done. Mm -hmm. And so often, you know, our leaders come to Common Ground because they're, they say that we get things done. 60 houses in Sherman Park that have been rehabbed over three years. Uh, a healthcare insurance company that now insures about 25,000 lives. Um, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. How do you determine the initiatives, the, the issues that you're going to work on? So if you look at Fair Play as an example, um, that came out of having conversations with about 1,400 people. And we went out and we asked them what they would do if they had tens of millions of dollars to spend in their community. And we heard a lot of things. Um, we chose the athletic facilities because a lot of people talked about our youth needing um, more investment. <clears throat> And it also made sense because it was a parallel investment. We were going to call for the upgrading of kids' athletic facilities while the Bucks were asking for the upgrading of their facilities. So it worked politically. It was something that we could go door to door on and talk to people about, and they would get it instantly. So it was a combination of talking to people and hearing what they wanted done and then figuring out what would work politically and practically. Mm -hmm. I was struck when I looked at issues you choose. I, I think you said they need to be winnable. Yes. Why, why is that important? I mean, you know, people might say, well, you should just do it because it's the right thing to do. But you say it needs to be winnable. Why? Yeah. Part of our strategy is that if we're going to take people's time, take their energy, we want to make sure that it results in something real. 
Because when you look at our neighborhoods, when you look at our schools, you see there are real things that need to be fixed and changed. And life is short. And so we want to take the most of the time that we have and really get things done. I want to uh, follow up on, on what you touched on earlier, Keisha, about some of the things you're doing, whether it's in Sherman Park with the Milwaukee Rising Project where you're rehabbing homes, or whether it's the health care cooperative that Common Ground has, has uh, uh, created. But I, uh, since Jennifer raised this, the Fair Play campaign, let's get into the arena discussion, because that's where I think Common Ground's profile rose even greater. Yes. Um, so people in this room are certainly familiar. We have uh, very wealthy owners of the Bucks franchise, uh, and uh, they asked the city and the state to contribute public dollars in addition to private dollars to get a new arena. Uh, let's walk through Common Ground's uh, position on this, because it sort of, I think, evolved over time. Yes. Um, initially, when the Bucks said, um, look, we're willing to do this, but then public money has to do this. What was your initial position on, on that? Our initial position was that we should have a broad investment, so not just invest in downtown, but invest in downtown and in the neighborhoods, particularly in the places where kids and families are playing. Mm -hmm. So uh, initially you were like, okay, we would be open uh, to public money being used for that as long is there is public money used for these other needs, is that correct? Right, so we are trying to broaden the scope, broaden the benefit, saying look, this can be a win for the bucks, it can be a win for downtown, but it can also be a win for the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And Keisha, tell people in the room, some of whom probably are familiar, but some who may not be familiar, what specifically were you asking in terms of funding for school athletic facilities or for playgrounds? Yeah, our, our initial ask was that <laughs> If we're going to use public money for the bucks, we want to see at least $150 million used to upgrade and fix outdoor recreational facilities for children. So when you uh, proposed this, what was the reaction? What reaction did you get from, from those involved in the arena discussions? The, so and one of the reactions was that it seems like a perfect symmetry, that if you talk about a place for the bucks to get to play, the kids to get to play. So it plays from that perspective. And we were invited to be a part of the task force. Do you mm -hmm. remember the task force? Yes. Yeah, so there was, there was initially this like, yeah, this should be a broader discussion and why shouldn't we include things like playgrounds, things like the art museum, the public museum, and other questions. So I would say initially there was reception and there was a sense of, oh, that's a really clever ask. Okay. And, and that then evolved into what? That's a clever ask, but, yeah. but where did it go from there? <laughs> it all changed as soon as Herb Cole sold the Bucks. When Wes Edens and Mark Lassery took over control of the team, they took over control of the whole process around getting a new arena. They were not interested in a referendum, which is kind of what everyone initially thought would happen. Um, that's why we were talking about an issue we could go sell door to door. And as soon as it wasn't about a referendum, it was about just ramming it through, right, as fast as you could, and we were shut out of the discussion. We tried to get a meeting with Edens and Lassery, and at one point, Edens did agree to meet with us. Um, Don Walker from the Journal Sentinel had publicly asked him, will you meet with Common Ground? They're asking to meet with you, and he said yes. We followed up. Keisha made I don't know how many nice phone calls to 20. his secretary, right? never met with us, totally dismissed us. So we were left with, what are we gonna do? Are we just gonna take this? Are we just gonna be ignored? Or are we gonna fight back and say, you know, this is not okay? And so we chose to fight back. And how did you do that? Well, around that time, one of our organizers in Sherman Park who was digging into the uh, foreclosure issue was looking particularly at a couple problematic houses and discovered that they were owned by Nation Star Mortgage. And furthermore, she dug a little deeper. She's sitting right over there today. Um, she found that Nation Star Mortgage was connected to Wesley Edens. He is the chairman sure, of the board. board. And so we realized that we had leverage there. Um, we could embarrass him into either meeting with us and talking about our Fair Play initiative, or we could embarrass him into doing something about the foreclosed properties that he wasn't taking care of in Milwaukee. So that was really a turning point in the campaign right there. And, and at that point, uh, 
did uh, Common Ground decide we can no longer support the arena as long as there's going to be public money for, um, for a new facility, but not public money for some of the things that your constituents told you they wanted? Is that the point where you said we can no longer support the arena? In, right. At yeah, least the proposal in, as in it's October presented. of, I guess that would have been 2014. 14 is when we had the assembly with about 700 people where we took a vote. And the vote was to oppose the use of public money for an arena. Was it pretty because decisive, Keisha? It was incredibly decisive. Mm -hmm. There were no no votes. Um, and it was, you know, that was after 18 months of playing the game like we're taught to play the game. You send the letters, you make the phone calls, you ask the people that know people to set up meetings, and none of those things worked. And so by that time, our folks were angry. And, and then when we understood that Mr. Edens was a billionaire with his own capacity and had crappy houses in our neighborhood, and there was nothing being done about that, that our folks were like, we cannot let this stand. So uh, let me pick up that part of the story. So you mentioned the, the fact that you realized there was a relationship between Nationwide and, and Mr. Edens, one of the Bucks owners. So on the foreclosure issue, what were you able to achieve in, in your efforts to, I think as you described it, Jennifer, pressure them to, to make some, uh, to address in some way some of what Milwaukee faces, uh, particularly in parts of our central city? Well, we, Keisha and I actually flew to Dallas to go to the Nation Star stockholders meeting. Nation uh, Star, I'm forgiving, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, we were hoping to get to directly confront Wes Edens there because as chairman of the board, you would expect him to be at the stockholders meeting. He wasn't there, so we confronted Jay Bray, who was the CEO, and got him to agree to come back to Milwaukee and start negotiations with us around what can we do about these Nation Star properties in Milwaukee? How can we make this right? And from there, we tried to continue negotiating with them. And at some point, they got so mad at us that they stopped negotiating with us. Um, so we took on the role of applying pressure from the outside because they continued to negotiate with the city once we had brought them here initially. So they were negotiating with the city and Alderman Murphy. So we were applying pressure from the outside. And in the end, to Alderman Murphy, essentially? To Alderman Murphy and to the mayor, okay. right? And mm -hmm. to Nation Star, right? We were putting a lot of pressure on them to do something because they wanted us to go away and stop bringing up this issue. They wanted to get their money for the arena, and we weren't going to drop the issue until they did something. So in the end, the mayor and Alderman Murphy signed a deal with them for about $30 million. Um, the bulk of that's being used to rewrite people's mortgages so they can stay in their homes. But we figure about 600 families are going to get to stay in their homes as a result of this. And then there was another, was it 500,000 that went into a fund that gives people grants for home repairs? So you may not know, but if your home is underwater, you can't get a home improvement loan to put a new roof on or do those other needed repairs. So that's what this grant program is for. Do you consider, go ahead. And, and, yeah. and a critical part of that <clears throat> negotiations was common ground saying, that unless Nation Star puts up $30 million, that we don't think that our, should, our city should negotiate with West Edens to give our $80 million to the city. And so that created a lot of pressure on the mayor and the Common Council, the mayor and um, Alderman Murphy. And so that, I think it was August 29th, was the press conference to announce the $30.5 million. And then the next week was the hearing on the public money for the city and the bucks. When, when you look at back, look back at it, do you consider what happened with Nation Star to be a success? Is it a common ground inspired success in your opinion? Absolutely, Absolutely. it's in the the top, you know, two of our organizing history as common ground, as in and our network as of our sister organizations. So that's a success. Why do you think you weren't successful at getting? the members of the Common Council to say no to the request for public money as long as there was not money for other needs. Why, why didn't that happen? Um. So I'll just be frank, <laughs> because they were dealing with billionaire bullies. And the threat to move the team from the city terrified the mayor who is running for re-election and the Common Council, just like it's terrified 
other mayors and other common council people and other state legislatures across this country when NBA, NFL teams come to ask for our public money. They cower. They don't fight back. And we think that was the problem. There was no political courage to say, look, if you understood who Mr. Edens and Mr. Lassie were, they are real estate developers. And when you look at other examples of places that they said they were going to move the team to, you show me where they could have gotten the real estate they got in downtown Milwaukee in a Las Vegas or a Seattle. It wasn't going to happen. Do you, do you think, uh, let me pose a few questions that you'll hear on the, the other side of this argument. Um, if the council members had adopted Common Ground's point of view, the argument is um, there would not have been public money made available by the city, and that yes, there is a risk that the NBA franchise um, uh, would have left town. Um, would that have been okay with you? So from our perspective, we think there was a negotiation point. I mean, if you if you were to ask me if I was the mayor and if you were the mayor, I was in that same situation. <laughs> yes, what would you have done? There, what would we do? <laughs> we would have understood. Okay, look, Mr. Edens, we know you're a real estate developer. You want the land. We'll give you the land, but you need to pay the 50 million from our city because we have other needs in our city where that money needs to go to. And there was an opportunity. We think for a real negotiations, because we had some power going into that discussion. And we don't think that the way that negotiations happened, that there was a recognition of the power that we brought to the table. You're nodding in agreement. Uh, what specifically are you agreeing with here? Yeah, I agree with what Keisha said, but I'm also surprised that you're not asking the question, why didn't they fund both, right? Why didn't they fund the kids' playgrounds and the arena? And to this day, um, it's, it's, um, it's hard for me to answer that question. I mean, you don't know how many public officials that we talked to or high-level bureaucrats who just looked at us and just made excuses when it came to our kids' playgrounds. And we're not talking about playgrounds that just need a new coat of paint. We're talking about places where the kids can't even practice there. They have to travel to another place because the facilities are so inadequate. Or where the kids have to go out and buy kitty litter to soak up the water so they can play a game. I mean, there are real needs, and I want to know why they won't address them. I mean, they look at us and they're like, oh, we don't have enough money. The bonding authority is out. That's not our responsibility. Who do you think you are asking for this? I mean, that's the part that really angers me about this whole thing. Why couldn't they have tried to do both? They went out of their way when the bucks came. They didn't tell the bucks we don't have any money. We're out of bonding authority. That's not our responsibility. They didn't tell the bucks you've got enough money to do it yourself. They figured out a way to do it. Why couldn't they figure out a way to do it for our kids? Oh, what's your answer to that? Why, why don't you? I don't know, but they it makes me that. mad. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so here's one of the, the questions that also came up in this discussion, and that is, and, and you mentioned this, Keisha, and I think there is, uh, we've had this discussion at, at this law school on a number of occasions about what is the proper use of public money for mm -hmm. sports arenas, and what are the benefits of sports arenas, too. We've talked about that at conferences here. Uh, and there are different views of that. Um, but the argument also goes in this is that this is the way these things are done. Whether we agree or disagree, if you want a major league franchise in your city, they tend to be public-private partnerships. Somebody puts up part of the money, somebody puts up part of the money, the other somebody being the public. It's just the way it happens. And communities have to make decisions about that. Um, does that argument hold any um, merit to you? Absolutely not. I mean, you know. But, but is that the real no, world? That, I mean, so you know, I think the real my, world. Our perspective is that, okay, you can look at the streets of Milwaukee and certain parts of the city, you drive down them and you bust out your tire. Well, that's just the way it is because money has to go in other places. There's lots of, or the houses are dilapidating and not being fixed up. Oh, that's just the way it is. It's like from our perspective, our leaders are like, no, we want to live in a world that it, the way it should be and all the roads should be fixed. And we should be able to have a discussion about what is the proper use of public money. There's a history in this city of how public money was used for the greater good 
which you see skeletons of that history here. So, you know, we don't buy into that. That is just the way it is. Because if that was the case, common ground wouldn't be here. Because people would just lay down. Milwaukee is just the most segregated city in the world. That's just the way it is, and we can't do anything about it. It infuriates me when people think like that. So both of you are still after the, the arena process. I, I, I hear what you said, Jennifer, and I hear what you're saying, Keisha. You're, you're not happy with, with the, <laughs> the outcome, at least in, in terms of the fact that there was not public support for uh, athletic facilities and for playgrounds, that, that our city fathers didn't live up to that. You're unhappy about that, which leads me to my next question. So politically, You've talked about the spring elections. What will Common Ground do in the spring elections? And what can you do? Because you're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. 501c3, it's forbidden from Amen, endorsing brother. candidates. Mm -hmm. What can you do? What will you do? Endorsing or opposing candidates. All right. So that's the. So what our focus is, which we laid out last night, is that we're targeting citizens. We want to increase voter turnout and six wards in the city that have the highest drop off from when presidential, from the 2012 presidential to the 2012 local election. It's, I mean, there's wards where there's 80% drop off, where people just sat on their couches, they just let it go by, and didn't think that they had a role and a say in that. And so, so as a C3, voter turnout, civic participation, Civic engagement is perfectly within our wheelhouse. So how do you encourage people? What, what are you going to tell them that changes this pattern that says we have big turnouts in November of presidential election years and we don't have such big turnouts in other elections? So we're going to go door to door and we're going to have individual conversations with people around our platform for investing in neighborhoods. But we're going to talk to them about how do they know that $80 million was given away by our common council and our mayor to build a new arena downtown, and that we're asking for $80 million to be invested in neighborhoods. What do they see in their neighborhood that needs to be fixed or built or beautified? And we're going to have a conversation around what they want to see done, and we're going to talk about the ideas we have that we've heard from other people, and we're going to say, look, we believe if enough of us get out to vote, we can show that we matter, our neighborhoods matter, and we can get some of these things fixed. Uh, I think in the newspaper story I saw the other day uh, that touched on this subject, you said you really don't care who, who people vote for, you just want them to participate. Yeah, right. But don't you really care who people vote for? I mean, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't you rather see people who voted against the arena deal back in office? Wouldn't you rather see people who voted for the arena deal not in office? I mean. Isn't that so just a from, from our perspective that when you understood, you look at the arena deal, it was Democrats and Republicans that bipartisanly voted on a massive giveaway. And so from our perspective, it doesn't matter who's in office, it's a question about what's the culture of this city and who are the people that when the mayor and the common council go to make a decision about significant public dollars, who do they talk to? And right now they don't talk to us. Mm -hmm. So last night you, you began. So, so I was no, saying, so it doesn't matter who wins. The, what matters is do they see us as citizens, as people that they need to deal with when they make significant decisions about how our money gets spent. So, so tell me about last night uh, at, at your meeting, you, you began putting together a platform that you'll use for the spring election. What will that platform look like? What are the types of issues that people will see on that platform? So you'll see some of the athletic fields and play areas that were part of our fair play campaign are going to be part of it. Um, fixing potholes, fixing street lights, um, planting trees and other things to beautify neighborhoods. On the south side, there's a real need for an indoor soccer facility for youth. Um, what am I forgetting? There's a um, revitalization of Center Street from 35th to 60th. Mm -hmm. Demolition of blighted properties. Um, more grants for home improvement repairs. I think that's the bulk yeah. of the platform right now. Mm -hmm. And, and you want people to look at your platform, and potential voters to look at your platform, and say, hey, this stuff inspires me to get out there and vote and get off the couch, I think, as you put it. Yeah. Is that what you're hoping for, ultimately? Yeah, right. And that they'll have a conversation with the people that are running, saying, like, look, where do you stand on these things? Do you think that uh, uh, when you look at the candidates uh, running uh, in the spring election, do you think many of them are on board with the ultimate goals of Common Ground? 
based on, on your... We're going to find out. So we don't know. We haven't talked to him yet. Here's the question, though. Once you find out, <laughs> because of your legal status, what can you do about it? If the people you don't necessarily think are backing the, the goals of common ground, but you can't do anything because you're, you know, is, doesn't that feel somewhat restrictive? I mean, you know. Well, I, that's a decision that our leaders are going to have to evaluate, you know, after this campaign of we have a C3 and we have a C4. Mm -hmm. Should we have used our C4 more? Mm -hmm. Should we have used our C3 more? And where our leaders are now is that they're very clear that we want to target citizens to see if we can get them out to vote. And if we can shift the discussion in this election to not be about personalities or empty promises, but to be about neighborhoods and real things that people have to deal with every day. Okay. That's so, going to be our litmus test. Right. And the other part of it is, I mean, Keisha is sort of saying this, but I'm going to be really clear, is about making common ground stronger. If we can show people in the city that we can go out to a primarily white neighborhood, a primarily African-American neighborhood, and a primarily Hispanic neighborhood, and we can put people on the streets who will go door to door and make a significant increase in voter turnout, we think that increases our power. This, and that's one of the interesting things about this organization. It is uh, very racially diverse. It, mm -hmm. it is, and it's very interesting. And you talk about the wow counties, and many people think that the wow counties don't have a lot in common with Milwaukee County. What's your reaction to that? Do you think there, obviously you feel there are central themes that are common to all the folks in those four counties? Yeah. Well, one of the things I hear when I'm talking to people in the suburbs is that there's a lot of poverty there and people don't want to admit it, it or mm -hmm. acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And if you're you know, struggling with poverty, it doesn't matter where you live, you're struggling with a lot of the same issues. So we hear about that. Um, transportation, jobs are a problem in the suburbs, just like they are in the city. Healthcare is universal. Pretty much things are universal. Mm -hmm. So we've spent a fair amount of time talking about the arena and, and about the elections, but I want to talk about other things that your organization is involved in. You touched on a couple of them earlier, Keisha. Um, a healthcare cooperative. I mean, how many people now are part of this healthcare cooperative? 25,000 belly buttons. And 25,000 belly buttons. <laughs> and initially, what were you projecting? It was far below that, wasn't it? Oh, initially. 10,000, so something like that? Yeah, I mean, we had a modest mm -hmm. goal when we started, um, I think it was three years ago? Three years ago, of to see if we can get 10,000 people to sign up for our insurance. And we roll out the gates, and I think we had that in like two months. So and so there was massive interest. Um, so now in our third year, we're at 25,000 belly buttons. Is it, is it challenging? We, we hear uh, in part of our political discourse these days, people talking about the good and the bad with the Affordable Care Act, with Obamacare. Has that been a tough endeavor for you? Has it been challenging? What are the challenges, I guess, is a better question. I mean, it's, you know, any business, right, that starts the first five years of the critical time and there's a high percentage of them that make it and a high percentage of them that don't. And um, so definitely there's challenges, um, but there's also huge opportunities when you look at the profits that like the Aurora's, the Wheaton Franciscans are getting from the Affordable Care Act, it's amazing, right? Like because there was uncompensated care, so people were going, they weren't getting paid for it, now they're getting paid for it. So we're talking in the hundreds of millions of profits. So there's lots of opportunity there, and you know what we see is that people need access to affordable, quality health care, mm -hmm. and an insurance company that cares about people, not just profits. You know, a another thing, and another project we'll talk about here is, is Milwaukee Rising, and maybe, you know, Jennifer, perhaps you can take a couple of moments to tell people in this room, I think Keisha said, rehabbing 60 homes in the Sherman Park neighborhood. Um, I assume that you heard a lot from people in this community about their neighborhoods, that they feel passionately about them, but they're worried about troubled properties and what that can mean for a neighborhood. How long did you talk about doing the housing piece of this before you actually went into that? Mm, that was before I joined Common Ground. Okay. Yeah, there was a, um, so the, our Milwaukee Rising campaign was a two and a half year campaign. Okay. And it started with neighborhood walks, around the center district area to talk with homeowners about their concerns in their neighborhood. 
And so they pointed to the, at that point, the houses weren't boarded up and they were just left there. And um, so we had to figure out who owned the houses. We had to identify the banks. We had to go to Germany to get Deutsche Bank to come to Milwaukee. And so it was a two and a half year campaign before we like really won the $33.8 million that was invested. And so we're three years into that and our goal is 100 homes in four years. I've got to ask you, you, you talk about the process there. Uh, that had to be sort of an amazing journey, didn't it? I, I mean, I, I think people understand that we had a, a collapse of the housing market, but I don't think people completely understand just how many people were involved in that collapse. What was that process like as you began to unwind the, the, the origins of the, the housing crisis? Yeah, so I, as I remember the stories, because it was also before I came to Common Ground. Very, I'm, I'm not being fair to you, 2011, that's, that's when you came aboard. So, yes, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but the, the conversations I remember is that you know, these neighborhoods, you've just seen these houses emptying, and, these, and then the crime happening, and the houses being stripped, and so that's why the churches in our Sherman Park area said, we need to go out and talk to the neighbors and you know, just see what's their concern. And we actually started out with a crime and grime um, <laughs> campaign that then you know, led us to the housing issue because when you have these houses that are just left, then it attracts all kinds of bad activity. And what Common Ground did, you know, I think was brilliant. They, they researched the issue. They did a, um, a forum where they had 200 people come and they had a panel to talk about like what happened, like why is this happening? And the conclusion was that there were banks that were headhunting poor people and getting them to buy mortgages that were unsustainable. And when they lost their jobs, they couldn't afford it. And so we were able to like say, look, um, Deutsche Bank, like, you're in Germany. Why do you have these kinds of mortgages in Milwaukee and what are you gonna do about it? And so once our leaders figured out who was responsible, then it gave a lot of energy to say, okay, now we gotta get those people to see our phases, to see our neighborhoods, to see the blight that they're creating, and to get them to do something about it. Mm -hmm. And from that point, our folks were off and running. And so we were clear that Deutsche Bank, US Bank, Bank of America, Chase, and Wells Fargo were the five targets that we were targeting to get them to put back, to fix what they broke in our neighborhoods. I spent a little bit of time on, on the, the organization's efforts on the south side. What, what are you doing on the south side of Milwaukee right now? Well, right now, one of the issues that's come out of the south side is around um, school bus safety. Mm -hmm. You may not know this, but in Milwaukee, it's illegal for school buses to put out the red stop sign when they're picking up and dropping off kids. I did, you're right, I did not know that. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, most people are surprised. Yeah. I mean, if you, even if you look at the driver's ed manual, it says that school buses will put out the stop sign and that you have to stop as a motorist. So people here are confused. Kids are not protected by having the traffic stop. And Milwaukee, we've learned, is really the only major city in the country that's like this. And so our people from the south side have been working with the Common Council, and Alderman Perez has sort of been leading this effort. Um, to get that changed, and it's been amazingly difficult. Why? It seems like a no-brainer issue. Um, What's your sense of why that is? Why? <laughs> <laughs> why is that? You are, I wish I was inside your head a couple of times here today. <laughs> you know exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> Before Jennifer answers that question, I want to go back to what were we doing. So yeah. we, um, so Kathleen Patron um, was our organizer. She's been promoted and is moving to Boston. Mm -hmm. But she did 500 individual meetings with leaders and potential leaders on the South Side to see if we could find a group and a number of institutions that want to be in relationship with Common Ground and have some real power to get things done on the South Side. Like, so, and then after they did house meeting, what we call them house meetings, small group meetings with about 250 people, this issue around indoor soccer complex came up because there's thousands of kids on the South Side that want a place to play soccer and there's no place for them to play. Um, and then the, the concern that people were having about near misses of kids almost getting hit because they get off the bus, the bus leaves, and then motorists are zipping by. 
Um, so, so that was the background work that really led to that issue. You're being diplomatic, aren't you, about you? Because you still want to get it done, right? Absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, and I, you know, and I think so. The question of like why? Yeah. So it's like, why does Common Ground exist? Because people like us get dissed and dismissed when you go and try to get things done. If we had a billion dollars, we wouldn't be having this problem. This is an interesting point in the conversation because a lot of times when we have people here uh, from different walks of life, I'll, I'll ask them about why they're doing what they're doing in their lives today. And, and I thought that would be very instructive here. I'd love to know about your involvement in Common Ground, how it happened for you. Jennifer, I'll begin with you. Um, well, I got involved in Common Ground five years ago. It was almost the exact same time that Keisha came because uh, there were historic budget cuts to the schools at that point. Um, the federal stimulus money for the schools had run out at the exact same time. My kids go to an MPS school and the school was being gutted. We were going to lose 33% of our staff. A third of the adults in the building were going to be gone. And the school was going to be devastated. So we tried to organize as parents. Um, it was re immediately clear that we did not have the power to do anything. Um, so I just felt <coughs> powerless, and I had no way to protect my kids. They felt like they were being punished, their schools being destroyed. Um, and around that time, someone from my church introduced me to Keisha and Common Ground. And when I saw what they were doing in Sherman Park, I was so impressed with their ability to take this huge issue like foreclosure and bring it down into something that they could make meaningful change with and that they were really about getting things done. I've been volunteering with them since then. Mm -hmm. How about your involvement? Yeah, so I've been an organizer in our network for 14 years. And, but the, the root of what motivates me, I'm born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. And my high school senior year, I was the captain of the girls' basketball team, very proud. <laughs> and we laced up our shoes, we went to practice every day, and we played, and we lost every game. <laughs> every game. It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> but you're over it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to say that losing was, was an unusual experience, but it wasn't. Because in my neighborhoods, we lost. Because where, where I lived looked drastically different than where I went to school. When it came to opportunity for our men, we lost. Um, we lost a lot in life. And I'm sick of losing. And Common Ground teaches people how to win in life, where it matters, to get the things done in their neighborhoods that if they had a billion dollars, they would never have to worry about. And so I'm committed to teaching people how to win in life. Mm -hmm. And that's what Common Ground does. So I brought this up earlier, and maybe I'll wrap up my part of the, the conversation. We'll take some questions from the audience. But but as I listen to some of the frustrations you have, there, there are probably different avenues in which you can try to effectuate change. And one of them is politics. And, and just to say, I'm going to work through a political party, or I'm going to work through a, a political action committee, or something. Obviously, you've chosen to go a somewhat different route. Um, why is that? Why haven't you perhaps tried to, to bring about change through politics? Are you saying me personally? Or? Yeah, either of you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm just saying it's another yeah, avenue. So, yeah. so the first time I voted, I was, I think I was 25 or 27. It was the uh, Clinton, no, it was the Gore and mm -hmm. Bush mm -hmm. catastrophe. <laughs> and I remember I called my grandmother, and I was like, Grandma, guess what I did? It's like, I voted. She's like, yes, it was your first time. Because she voted in every election. That wasn't my experience. So politics... No, I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in <coughs> real life. And I'm interested in being able to speak the truth, to be able to confront when you see slum landlords doing things in neighborhoods to say something about it. In politics, as I've seen it, that opportunity doesn't exist. You think you can get more done doing it the way you're doing it right now than working I through think the we political have. system? Yes. Jennifer, why not politics instead of, I mean, some of the issues, talk about funding for schools, some of those are inherently political issues. 
Why not politics? Uh, well, it's interesting that you asked me that question because when I was younger, I was really interested in going to politics. Uh, when I left college, I actually went to work for a member of Congress. And I thought that's where my life would lead. And um, different things happened. I actually became a teacher. And you know, we'd come down several years later, and I'm a stay-at-home mom, and this happens to my kids. And when I found out about Common Ground, my first reaction was, you know, who are these people? Right? I never encountered anything like this. I, I'm a political science major. They didn't teach me about common ground and people like Keisha when I was in school. I never knew that this was an option. And once I saw how common ground works, I was just so impressed um, with the way that they work and the way that they get things done and that the way that they listen to and help ordinary people that I'm just committed to doing it that way. Let's take some questions from the, uh, the audience. Uh, let me uh, just refresh everyone's memory here. If you're in the seating bowl down here, press down on the rim, not on the ball, but on the rim. Keep your finger down on it, and we'll all be able to hear your question. If you're in the back and you have a question, uh, Ryan, the gentleman over there, has a microphone. He'll come over and hold it so that we can hear your question. So please raise your hand, and we'll take a few. Uh, there's a gentleman right there in the blue sweater. Hi, thank you very much for uh, for being here today, and congratulations on all the great work that you do. I'm I'm new to Milwaukee and very much inspired by by what you're doing. Uh, a question that I have is: um, Do you feel at this point with the the arena deal and so forth, is using the Milwaukee Bucks as leverage to to build some of your the the, the ideas of the playgrounds and so forth? Um, has that road ended, or do you think there's more opportunities to engage the Bucks moving forward? Um, to put pressure on them to possibly, I mean, they're still making a lot of money, so is there a possibility of re-engaging them to continue with this idea that you guys have? Because I, I think it's a fantastic idea, and I'd love to see uh, organizations like the Bucks or the Brewers, or especially sporting organizations that, are, that should be pushing for physical activity for children. Um, I'd love to see them engaged in that. Do you think there's more opportunities in the future, or do you think, you know? I'll Honestly, I think that has ended. Um, if common ground is anything, we're politically savvy, and now that the Bucks have gotten what they wanted from the city, which was public money to build their arena and the land around it, we don't have any leverage. So that's why we're going after getting those playgrounds funded in our Neighborhoods Now campaign. And we're focusing that campaign very deliberately around the local elections because everybody who votes has leverage. Other questions? Yes. On the rim. There you go. On the rim. No, nope, the rim. Okay, got yeah. it. Thank you. Can you describe the candidate forums that Common Ground is anticipating in the spring election in the next few months? So we're going to do candidate forums um, in aldermanic districts around the city, and then we're also going to do one citywide, a mayoral candidates forum. We're going to do them after the primaries, so it'll be narrowed down to two candidates. The mayoral forum. And the aldermanic forums will all actually work the same way, where we're going to present our Neighborhoods Now platform, why we think this investment is important, what we've heard from people, and we're going to talk about our strategy of going out and engaging voters and increasing turnout, and we're going to ask the mayoral candidates to respond to that. We're also going to be talking to them about Do Not Stand Idly By, which is our gun violence reduction uh, campaign, and a few other issues. So we're going to let the citizens of Milwaukee hear from the mayoral candidates and the aldermanic candidates. Mm -hmm. And these will be forums around the city or around the... The mayoral, the mayoral candidate right. forum will just be one. Just one. Right, in the central center of the city. And then, and then the... Aldermanic, yeah. Yep, yeah, okay. in the districts. Do you have anything right, you want to add to that? Nope, that yeah. was good. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, Mike. I want to thank you for having these people here today. This is, as you know, I come very often. This most most impressive... Uh, events that you've had. This is fantastic. My question is regarding <coughs> my, my question was, is regarding the mental health services in the county. And I'm hoping that Common Ground can also get into this problem. It affects our incarceration problem. Yes. It affects every single neighborhood, almost every single family. And in fact, using the public enterprise uh, 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 committee, which was started by Frank Zeidler in 1946, 
we're sponsoring a conversation in March regarding the mental health situation in Milwaukee, in the city of Milwaukee and the county, and I hope you join in. And I'd like to know whether in your meetings you have discussed the possibility of getting into the mental health problem area. That, that issue has come up. Um, our sister organizations in Chicago are actually working <clears throat> on a strategy of addressing this question of training for officers so that they know what to do when they encounter a person that's mentally ill. And there's actually a judge in Dade County in Florida that has reduced the prisons so much that they've had to close them down because they've trained officers to actually be able to spot people that are dealing with mental illness and get them to the right place so they can get the care that they need. So that's definitely something that's come up in our organizations. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Hang on a second, we'll wait for Ryan in the microphone. I want to thank Jennifer and Keisha for representing Common Ground in such a provocative and persuasive way. I'm actually unable to move past something you said, Mr. Goucher, talking about just the way things are, public and private partnerships in, in um, athletic facilities. We've heard that before, but suddenly today I'm thinking, wait a minute, in partnerships, both sides or all the sides invest, <laughs> all the sides reap the benefits. I look at this and think, wait a minute, we citizens are investing our hundreds of millions and our partners, the bucks, are reaping the benefits. So that's just my opinion and nobody asked for it. But I guess I want to say, I compliment Common Ground for not being naive, for being astute and saying, no, these partners have no incentive to fund other things in our city. They're doing just fine, thank you. And I guess the one more thing I'd say is, why in the world do we continue to create partnerships that are all give and no take? Amen. Okay. Yes. Down on the rim, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe what the Golden State Warriors did when they built their new arena? Yeah. Do you want to they paid for it all themselves. They did it without public money. It can be done. That, you would agree, though. That is the exception to the rule, is it not? It is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the future to the rule. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yes. That really isn't the exception to the rule because I would have loved to have had uh, Jane Pettit in the room and a younger Herb Cole in the room because in our, our lifetime 30 years ago, uh, I'm not so sure, but I'm not, I don't remember what Jane Pettit got out of the deal except uh, a nice house for all of us which is still a pretty nice house. And so uh, when Herb Cole bought the box and promised to stay here, uh, he made a lot of money doing other things, but I'm not so sure until the very end he made some money. So it's just been over 30 years in bigger um, cities in the country where real estate developers who we didn't know five years ago come in and take up and suck up a lot of money. Yeah, you say you have no leverage. But if you stop going to the basketball games, you have a lot of leverage. They can't survive without you, without the people who live in the city. Other questions? Yes. Well, I'm from Waukesha County, and as Common Ground Active, I know we sympathize a lot with what you're doing, and we care about Milwaukee and your money and your streets. Our, are Common Ground active in our area? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, we're active in Waukesha County, not as active as we are in Milwaukee. So in Waukesha County, um, that's where we increased money for the shared ride taxi. Uh, there were a number of people there who were dependent on that. I think it's mostly disabled people and seniors. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to increase service for them. That was an important issue. Um, right now, one of the things we're working on in Waukesha County are the stresses that parents and families are under. 
We hear a lot about this, um, various reasons that families and parents are under stress, and then the fact that they feel really isolated. They don't have a social or familial network to support them, and they don't know where to turn to get help for drug abuse issues or economic stresses and things like that. So we um, are working on a program to make parent cafes more available to families. And this is a forum where they can come and develop their parenting skills and get support. And if they are interested, come together with other parents and work on some of these pressures that are making life difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Power is related to money, to be sure, but it's also related to size. What is Common Ground doing to increase the size of its membership currently? Yes. Common Ground is always having conversations with potential member organizations that may want to join Common Ground. So if there's people in this audience that are inspired by what we do, we'd love to talk to you. If you know other people that are interested. And then part of our Milwaukee Neighborhoods Now campaign is to expand from our 600 conversations to have 4,000 conversations to see if we can identify new leaders in the city that want to fight and that are not just going to give in to the status quo but want to be a part of a strategy to see if we can continue to win for neighborhoods. Do you think you, um, I'm wondering, when you look at the membership of, of Common Ground, a lot of churches in, in the community, um, would you like to have more neighborhood groups be Come part of common ground in order to even give you more clout in terms of, of you know trying to affect public policy we're open to that we have some like we have the Sherman Park Action Network okay. which is mostly residents who live in the neighborhood and not necessarily a part of a church that are part of that um, some of our leaders on the south side are also um, a part of neighborhoods so we are open to you know any any kind of nonprofit for profit organization that's about the common good. Mm -hmm. okay. Other questions? All right. Well, I think we'll, uh, we'll wrap things up. Before we uh, thank our guests today, uh, I just want to say a couple words about um, some upcoming events, and two in particular. Tomorrow, we release the latest edition of the Marquette Law School poll. The poll director, Charles Franklin, will be here with me to uh, discuss the results. It'll look at the presidential race. It'll look at the U.S. Senate race. Some interesting uh, questions about uh, guns, immigration, and about water. Uh, for the first time, we're really doing some uh, polling on water issues, which are important uh, to the people of Wisconsin and the people in this region. And then I also want to mention we've got three events next week. Uh, one of them is already full, but I did want to uh, call your attention to that water-related event that we're doing next Thursday. We will be talking specifically about Waukesha's water diversion request, the request to have Lake Michigan water come into Waukesha to uh, address some of their water needs. We will have the mayor of Waukesha, Sean Riley, and also Racine's mayor, John Dickard, who's opposed to the diversion request. So those are two events that uh, you can uh, uh, join us for. Uh, also uh, join us anytime. Just go to our website, www law.marquette.edu. I want to say uh, thanks to everyone who came uh, to this event today. Thank you for your interest, your attention, uh, your attentiveness. Um, and thanks again to our guests today, Keisha Crum and Jennifer O'Hare of Common Ground. Thank you. Thank you.